Hi everybody, it's me again. I wanted to make another video. Uh, if you couldn't tell, I figured out how to make thumbnails, so that's pretty neat, I thought. This video that I wanted to make is probably for the a little bit older airmen. So the airmen that have senior airmen on that are getting ready to test for staff or is looking forward to testing for staff or anything such as that but that doesn't mean younger airmen can't know about this because eventually everybody will have to do this regardless if you're active duty guard or reserve everybody will have to go through ALS which is airman leadership school airman leadership school so I'm going to share kind of my experience with it I went through the one at JBSA Lackland at the Chapman Annex it used to be called the Medina Annex but it's now called the Chapman Annex Ours was about five and a half weeks long, but I was the last class to go through when COVID was hitting. So ours did get reduced about by a week and a half at the very most, just because we were halfway through already and they didn't want to restart the whole class of 80 all over again. So some big things that I learned about ALS, and I definitely agree that it does depend on your instructor. Our instructor was a technical sergeant who was also the NCIC of ALS at the time, which I absolutely adore him. I adore my flight and everyone that I absolutely met. I felt like I learned so much when I was at ALS to become the leader, to become the staff sergeant of who I am today. So I can reflect back on the stories that he told us and all the examples he gave us so I can become that better NCO for my future airman. My husband, on the other hand, who is also in the same class as me, but not the same flight, his instructor was a staff sergeant. He felt like he didn't really get to learn as much or maybe he felt like, oh, I already knew all this stuff. I didn't really learn anything. And I told him, you know what? I think it's kind of an instructor thing. I felt like with our technical sergeant, he was very passionate about it. And also being the NCIC, obviously that might make a little bit of a difference, of course. And that's just kind of how him and I saw ALS in different ways the curriculum in ALS does change every about two to three years is what we've been told so the very last class or the second to last class of fiscal year of 19 had the new curriculum at least at Lackland they did and my class was 20-3 so fiscal year of 20 but the third class to go so 20-3 that was my class so I went through the new ALS curriculum, what they have now, and I'll be explaining a little bit of that once we go on, just because I have a lot to speak about. But the, one of the very first days of our educations, or DOE, DO, as they called it, Day of Education, what we learned is the way that children learn is they memorize answers, and then that's it. But the way that adults learn, adults learn through experience. So that's why ALS had been changed so much from taking an EOC, taking from tests constantly, to where we were, where we only had like maybe three graded items and a capstone at the end and everything else was just really discussions and other things. Yes, you can still academically fail ALS and they'll let you know everything about that the first day as they go through all the rules of that kind of stuff. Um, we had a schedule that was on the that that's on a particular website it's like canvas if you've ever gone to college classes before and on there it tells you the uniform of the day so sometimes we would have to wear blues if maybe we we're taking a picture for our graduation day or we'd be in abus or ocps if you wear ocps and on every Friday, we got to wear neat casual or business casual. So basically, we got to wear civilian clothes, but there were still strict rules about it of what the boys could wear and what the ladies could wear. On the schedule, there was also duty flight. So duty flight just means which flight will be cleaning the building at the end of the day. We have reveille flight and retreat flight. So which flight is in charge of getting three to four members, I believe, to put up the flag in the morning and to take down the flag in the afternoon once the duty day is over for us. So at my particular ALS, we had five different flights. We had Vossler, Mathis, Erwin, Pitts and Barger, and Etchberger. 
I was an errand flight. I was actually the flight leader of my flight. And I'll talk a little bit about that and some rules of who kind of gets what. You can almost pretend it's like BMT, but you're an adult now, so they treat you as an adult. But everything is very time constrained and very, very of like, hey, it's this time we need to take a break. Or maybe it's this time when we need to take a break. We had PT three days a week, so we had ours, I believe, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. If we had PT, PT would start about 6.30, and they would always say, hey, make sure at least you're minimum five minutes early to PT. So that's 6.25. But for my flight, we had some troubles with people just showing up late, and then, of course, you're not allowed to use your phone during the duty day, so they would collect them, or you could just leave them in your car. So with my particular flight, I had told them that they need to show up at PT or to class 10 minutes before. If they could not show up to 10 minutes before, but still five minutes before, leave your cell phone in the car. I'll just let our instructor know. Every about hour or so, we took about a 10 minute break. And it was very important that we took these breaks because what we were taught is if you don't have a break, your mind is going to overload with so much information that you're talking about and you kind of need a refresher. You need that time to just take off, whether it's to speak to your other flight mates or to go to the other flight rooms and just speak to the other flights. Uh, In my particular ALS class, so 20-3, we had 80 people overall with five flights. That's 16 people per flight. There are guard and reserve members in people's flights. We had a prior army surgeon in our flight who is Air Force Band now. So he was the only staff surgeon in my flight. I had one reserve and one guard in my flight. But I do know that there was a civilian cop in my husband's flight. There was a prior Marine in another flight, Bossler's flight. So you get to meet really everyone and anyone. And the way that they choose order for ALS is like who's putting who has on staff sergeant, who's putting on staff sergeant, and when they're putting on staff sergeant, who's been an airman for a minimum of three to four years and they need to just go through ALS because as soon as they test and if they make staff, they'll be putting on right away and so forth and so forth. And like I said, ALS will usually teach you all this stuff. They'll give you handouts before you go so you can get it signed off with your first shirt and make sure that you're following the checklist correctly. Because the first day that we did show up, we were supposed to be in full service uniform. So mostly everyone was all in their blues. However, the Guard and the Reserve members, they were not because we were told usually they don't check their email so often as active duty does. So that was kind of interesting to learn the different perspectives of Guard and Reserve if you've never worked with them before. We also started on a Friday, so our classes were from about 7.45 to 15.45. And on Fridays, you're like, oh, I get off of work early and stuff. I don't think I ever left class or every day from school until about definitely after 4, 4.30, sometimes 5, just depending on if I had a flight leader meeting, if I had duty flight with my flight to make sure everyone was there or to do this or to to do that. So it was a lot of different things going on. So the different roles in a flight that you can sign up for. So you can sign up for every single role. And these aren't all the roles. I don't remember some of them, unfortunately. Um, But the only one that you cannot sign up for is for your flight leader. So the flight leader is basically like your dorm chief of BMT. And your instructor picks them, obviously. But you have your homework monitor, you have your guard person, so not a guard person, A-N-G, but the guard person of whoever teaches the other flight mates of how to do reveille and how to do retreat, so how to put the flag up and how to take the flag down properly and where to store it from there. You also will have some people that will get together a PowerPoint and all the pictures that will be shown during your graduation ceremony, so for that, We had two people do that. So basically anytime, either during class or during PT, they would step out of formation and they would take pictures of everyone working out. So at the end, during our graduation ceremony, we could all see it. Unfortunately, because COVID did hit, we did not have a graduation ceremony, but we still got the chance to see some of the pictures that our flight had taken. So we, that was pretty cool, I thought. 
um with the 10 minute breaks they are very very strict on those two they were and with us there's a sign in the bathrooms that says, hey, turn off the lights before you guys leave. Unfortunately, not all the time does that happen because the instructors obviously use the restrooms as well as the same where the students are. If they found out the lights are not being turned off, either in like a snack bar area where we store our lunch or in the restrooms, they would lock up the snack bar the entire day up until lunch and then lock it again afterwards. And they would have us, and we actually did, we had potty monitors. So potty monitors was whoever had, the flight leaders just decided, hey, whoever has duty flight this week, just make sure you're turning off the lights after every single break and that kind of stuff. So that's something they can do. And they also threatened that they would shut down the restrooms so they would lock them. So the restrooms, if we had to use them, we'd have to walk all the way to the base on Medina or Chapman Annex and that and going from all the way over there back to the schoolhouse was about a 10 minute walk so that was basically your whole 10 minutes of going to use the restroom if they needed to do that with um, the capstone so the capstone is a 10 scenario different kind of thing it's at the very end if for any odd reason that you fail the capstone or the other three graded assignments, which is two briefs and one paper, they do make you redo it. They call it a refire. A refire, they usually take about an hour out of the morning to after PT once everyone gets back. If people, if different flights say are doing refires. So my flight did not have to do a refire on the very first brief because everyone passed luckily but I know a lot of the other flights had to do a refire. So for my flight, we basically had to sit down in our flight room and just be quiet while other flights were doing their refire so they can make sure they pass. And with the new curriculum, they always wanna make sure that you guys will always pass. Your instructors are there to help you if you're not understanding stuff. Your homework monitor is there to reach out to your instructor or to your flight leader if they're not understanding something either. So definitely, when you go to ALS, you have to work together. If you don't, then it's just not gonna be any fun. There's a lot of reading, a lot, a lot of reading. We had over 400 pages to read in one night. Of course, that's not feasible so of course not all of us got to the 400 pages plus they tell you it's like hey if you don't read all 400 pages but you skim over it it's all right too because you do go over it the next day and that kind of stuff some different readings that we did was like intro to critical thinking communication and core values so those are just some examples of what we learned during our als time like I said, just work with your homework monitor and your flight leader if you're not one of those people and just be like, hey, how can we help our flight to do better, to do this, to get our reading done in time so we make sure we're prepared for the next day of class to discuss whatever we need to. You will also have two peer assessments. Our peer assessments were basically where you have 16 people in the flight, so you have to rank everyone from 1 to 16, whoever you think was doing the best and whoever you think was doing the worst. We also had to write a comment. It was, it's technically optional to write a comment, but if you did not write a comment for someone, they would know, and it's kind of awkward to be like, why didn't you write a comment for that person, but you wrote it for everybody else. For our first peer assessment, we were very hesitant about it because as peers, we didn't want to rank each other because we felt like that was very unfair. But as I'm talking about it and that kind of stuff, we did get over it. With the comments, you could tell people it's like, hey, constructive criticism. I think you're great. I really enjoy the stories you share, but maybe you're sharing a little bit too much. I know I had a few of those people in my flight, so that's what I kind of told them the first peer assessment. As we took our first peer assessment pretty early in the class, so we felt like we didn't get to know each other as much as the second peer assessment. My instructor had also told us um, he's had people that have proclaimed their love for another student in the flight, so please don't do that. Uh, he also had let us know if anybody cries over one of the comments that's said in our peer assessment that we are all going to be in very big trouble, obviously. 
So that's kind of some curriculum stuff that we kind of did and everything. Going back to the roles of talking about being a flight leader, um, every instructor is a little bit different of how they run their own individual flight. And some instructors kind of base it off of how the flight reacts to certain stuff. So with my flight, there was some stuff going behind the scenes with maybe so-and-so and then other so-and-so and somebody else and that kind of stuff. The reason why I was chosen as flight leader for my particular flight was my instructor had told me that I was basically it was easier between me or the staff sergeant so the prior army person who was um who was a staff sergeant going in the air force for the air, um for the band of the west it was between me or him to be flight leader but the reason why i was chosen is because i was seen more as empathetic um uh, our very first day like the very first day of doe one or day of education one one of the other personnelists in my class, which it was only me and her, and we're very good friends now, she had let me know. She's like, oh, yeah, this upcoming Tuesday, which we'd be in class that day, she said, oh, I'm going to be 22. She's only been in a little bit over three years now, so she's definitely the youngest in class. As her, myself, and another person who is admin, we have the shortest tech schools of our entire class or our entire flight just because we had a lot of intels in our flight we had some medical people in our flight and theirs are usually pretty long six to eight months as a minimum and ours is only 26 days long so that following weekend i texted her and i was just asking her like really simple like questions like very vague questions so i was like choose choose one do you want brown pink vegetable black and white or stuff like that and really I was trying to let her know what kind of cake do you like but without giving it away that I was getting her a birthday card and getting her cake. That following Monday of class for Doe 2 I went around and I had all my flight mates sign the birthday card for me and then I went to my instructor and had him sign the birthday card and he seemed a bit shocked saying that like oh we just started school and stuff it's like we haven't even chosen a flight leader and you're already getting a birthday card i didn't get a birthday card because i wanted to be a flight leader i know my sergeants my ncos my senior ncos back at my unit was like hey i think you should be flight leader you do a great job with being a leader with helping the trainees and helping the younger airmen here at the detachment i think you should try to go for flight leader and i was like yeah you know i'll, I'll try to if i don't like it's not a big deal. I just want to go to ALS, get it over with, have fun, meet some new people, kind of just network through them. And eventually, in fact, I did make flight leader just because it was just something as simple as one of the most shy people in class. I made her feel like she was included, even if maybe she didn't feel like she was included. But that's just who I kind of am as a person. Like I said, every single instructor sees their flight and who they want as their flight leader for that particular flight, for that particular class, a little bit different. I guess my last thing about with ALS is definitely network. Don't network, wait, hold on. Don't do network with your flight, but just not with your flight. Please network with your entire class. So if you have five different flights, network with the entire class. All of the instructors, all five of the instructors said we were the first class in a very long time to get together as a class, to just go across the hall and talk to the other flights, to get to know each other. It'll be easy to network to get along with your flight, but the other flights getting along with the other flights, that's pretty hard just because, hey, you don't spend all day in class with them. The only time you get with them is during drill and during... PT and during breaks and that kind of stuff. So if your flight can get together and then your class can get together, it'll just make for a much more fun ALS experience. You'll have much more fun getting to meet not only maybe your anywhere from 12 to 16 people up to your 50 to 80 people that you have in your class. I wish you the best of luck if you are going through ALS, whether it's online or in class right now. Please keep safe with what's happening right now in the world. And 
I hope you really enjoy my take on my personal kind of ALS experience and my kind of thoughts about it and tips and tricks with it. Thank you.